Okay, effective practice strategies. I am humbled and honored that I even got asked to do this. It's pretty incredible that we get to, I get to represent our program. Um, so who am I? I am Chelsea Leggett. I am from just north of um, Joplin. We live on a farm. I teach at Carl Junction, graduate at Carl Junction. Um, I work in the physical education department. I do outdoor pursuits. That's a new class we have. Well, this is our fourth year doing it. Um, I get to teach kids how to do cast iron cooking, air rifles, archery, a lot of fun stuff we do. Um, I actually got to tour this facility a couple years ago and watch their sixth grade program, which is incredible that they get to come in for their whole sixth grade year and be here during the Wolf School. It's pretty amazing. Um, I coach volleyball, soccer, track, basketball, air rifle, archery, um, but by far the most rewarding thing I've ever coached is archery. Um, I miss the intensity of other sports, but um, it's very intense when there's not a timeout in archery. Like, they're just going until they're done, there's no timeouts. So I, I love, love, love what I do. That's the only thing I do now is archery. Um, going into my, I just completed my 10th year teaching, going into our 10th year of archery, which is pretty awesome. Um, I'll be married 15 years this November. We continue to expand our farm and enjoy the outdoors. I have two sons. Um, you'll see a picture of them. There they are with their pet cow, Rosie. Um, this is my husband. He likes to fly airplanes aside from farming. And then um, Permanent Adventure. This is a camp I, um, we're kind of launching outside of school, which is fun. Um, it's just teaching kids how to see Christ outdoors. Um, it's kind of go hand in hand a little bit with Center Shot, but more than archery. So that's a little bit about me. And we will get on with it. Um, when I coached volleyball years ago, I coached with one of the top coaches in Southwest Missouri, and she just told me, if you set high expectations for your kids, they will meet them. Um, if there's accountability on your end, consistency, they will meet your expectations. So, beginning of the year, what we do is we talk to the upperclassmen, hey, what do you want to see now? COVID was very different. You had kids that were on quarantine, they're missing practice, they can't be there, and you have to just, you have to go with it. It is what it is. But during our normal season without COVID, without major illness or anything like that, um, we just sat down and we had expectations lined up from day one. That is, when someone is late to practice, what happens? Now I'm talking high school level in this moment, okay, high school level. And they figure out what happens. So for example, years ago we had, before COVID hit, um, if they were late, they had to do um, this target drill where they had to shoot so many arrows and anything outside the yellow, the rest of the team had to do something for it. Now that sounds mean, <laughs> that sounds maybe too much pressure, but um, again, I coached volleyball, basketball, all these other sports where there's very high expectation. Our athletic director told us when we started archery, I want you to be like any other sport and I want you to compete. So finding a level though that is healthy, because archery to me is way more than a number, Okay, um, we found a very healthy level, I believe, in the last um, several years that we've done this, where it is competitive, but we are not missing why we're there. Um, so we just set common expectations. Um, if somebody is goofing around on the range, what happens? And this is different for your team. I mean, we set it up to where everybody's on the same page. We go over it week one, and then we have to be consistent about enforcing it. Um, now, if somebody's sick, they're sick. There's nothing for that, okay? But if they are late because they talked too long for the girlfriend, boyfriend in the parking lot, and then they came into practice, it's not okay. So we just discussed that, no eating in practice, um, talked about moving around, and then arrow points aren't covered. That one in practice, we are very adamant about because I, I personally, how many of you post a tournament? Okay, it's very frustrating. When a school comes in and their arrow points are not covered, to me that's a very basic NAS rule. And I feel like as coaches, we have the honor to do what we do and the privilege to do what we do. And that's a number, that to me, that's one of the number one safeties as far as um, you know where you're pointing your arrow down range and covering the point of the arrow. So they do push-ups. If one person, everybody has to stop and do push-ups if the arrow is not pointed. And I promise you, their points are covered. It's very rare in a tournament that one of my kids does not have their arrows covered because of that. So that's just a couple examples there. Um, NAS rules, know them and enforce them in practice. And I personally am a little guilty of not, um, in years past, I have an assistant that I was more of the tech person 
I did all the computer stuff, registration, at a tournament, I ran scorecards, did all that. She was the range person. So she knew the rules better than I really did because she had to look at them more than I did. Um, but cell phones in practice, if NASA doesn't allow them on the range, don't allow them in practice. I know we live in a society um, where kids, we want to we want to meet them where they're at, but that doesn't mean lowering an expectation, um, in my opinion. So I, I've seen them at tournaments. It's very frustrating at tournaments when you see, you know coaches know better, but they're allowing it. And then the range official doesn't want to be the one, even though that's their job, is to enforce that. So as I think just don't allow them to practice, eliminate it. Um, covering points uh, of the arrows when moving around the range. Know the scoring protocol. I know that's changed several times over the last 10 years. But do know that. Um, I'll tell you, our elementary, and I'm not responsible for the scoring. I have other coaches that handle our elementary. But they have done an excellent job of teaching them how to score. And they have gone from our tournament, they'll score with the high school team, and they don't know how to score. The high school team that they're shooting with doesn't know how to score, but our elementary kids do. So it starts with us, and I think it's just a very important thing that we're teaching the right things in practice. It's worth taking the time to go over. Um, bow position when knocking an arrow, it's a common thing. No distracting noises on the line, just enforcing what we already know. Um, be all in. That is the number two point here. Uh, the team will feed off your energy and mood. Um, when I was student teaching in a local school of ours, I had a very small child, just had a kid. He was probably just walking at that point. I did not have any energy. I was in college, newborn, newlyweds, basically. Um, and I wasn't energetic. And the class knew that. And so they, their, their level was here because I was there, if that makes sense. So I just encourage you to be... Be all in if you're going to be there. Put your phone down. Uh, model the behavior you want to see in your kids because if we're not fired up about it. They're not going to be fired up about it. Um, the energy bus, we had to do this at school. Our whole department read the energy bus. If you've never read that book, it's phenomenal. I love it. It's, um, it's a good eye opener. Um, know your archers. You may have the best ideas in practice, but it may not be what your team needs or half of them what they need. Um, I've, I have spent time and time, just like all of you have, researching how can I reach my kids, how can I do this, and I'll come up with this great practice schedule, and then halfway through I'm like, and we're going to change it, because this, this is not what they need right now. Um, greet your archers every day by name. Um, throughout practice, make an effort to approach every archer multiple times, regardless if they need enforcement or a skill correction. Um, positive attitude and acknowledging a kid goes a long way. Just like that video we just watched, um, it's worth the time to meet them that day because you may be the only one that's met them throughout a whole school day. Give everyone a job. Um, this is, how many of you do not practice at your school? You practice in another facility. Okay. So from, just to give you a background, our program started off a little mezzanine with five targets. That's where we started. We had 40 kids up there once, which was a nightmare. Um, but we got smarter and we cut it in half, thirds, whatever, and got through it. So then as we evolved, we went to a church, and then we had about 10 targets set up. And that was that was our place there for a little bit. And then we went to an old grocery store, Dean's in Carl Junction, Missouri, which was an awesome facility, other than the fact that the ceiling was falling down. Um, heating there was a joke. So our kids, um, their fingers are always freezing, and our season is, you know what our season is, it's freezing. So we would have to have hand warmers, whatever we could do just to get through practice. But because of this, it made our kids respect taking care of things better. Um, so we had jobs every day in practice. We had a sheet, everybody's name. You guys have bathroom duties. Yes, bathroom duties, because we don't have a custodian. So they had to do bathroom duties. They had to mop the floor. They had to sweep the floor. They had to clean racks. They had to put chairs up. There's countless jobs that they did, and we just we went through it. And so facility duties, that's what I just went over. Um, practice travel duties. Everybody travels. It could be who's going to get equipment out, who's going to load the bus, who's going to make sure. I, I call it our bow medic bag. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, but so we just, we just made a list. That way it made everybody feel included. Now, it may just be that they're only on that list for maybe one or two weeks at a time, and then it rotates. But that's what we did for our program, and it seems to work pretty well. 
um, smaller size practices. This was the first year in a long time that I've had to coach more than just one. To give you an idea, our program is about, how many of you are over 100 plus 4th through 12th grade? Okay, okay. That's about where we are. It's about 100 plus 4th through 12th grade. We've got about 38 on the high school team, 40 on the middle school team, and around 25 to 30 on our elementary team. So this is the first year where I've had to pick up middle school and high school both. And our district, just because it is the way our district is, they're not to practice together. Because in no other sport practice middle school and high school, so we have to stay separate, if you will. Um, or it's encouraged, I will say. So we learn very quickly, if you want to eliminate discipline problems, you go to smaller sizes. So this was actually an example of the schedule that I, we did this year. So Monday, we go 3.30 to 5.30, high school full team, and then Tuesday, Thursday, we did split groups, 3.30 to 4.30 high school males, 4.40 to 5.40 high school females, and then right after that, kids you not, this is how long the practice was, 5.50 to 6.50 middle school, and then back to back. So um, when you have a family of your own, this is not healthy, okay? <laughs> but you have to do what you have to do. We have to meet these kids' needs so they can get better. Um, so we did that this whole season. That was our schedule. That's not counting our elementary. Our elementary had to squeeze in there also, but it worked. And instead of having this time that you're wasting, because when you have kids waiting and waiting and waiting, what are you really gaining out of that? So I just told myself, I would rather be here longer and get more one-on-one -on -one time with these kids and they get more out of the time. There was less behavior problems, worked out way better for us. So I just encourage you, if you've not, or, and I don't know what your schedules allow you to do. A lot of you work multiple jobs. A lot of you may not even teach. You may just be here as a coach, and you're not even at the school. So it, it depends on what your schedule can do. Um, but that's what we had to make work this year, and it worked very, very well. Um, benefits of small practices. More likely to notice a kiddo that's having a rough day. More one-on-one -on -one time. Less discipline issues generally means you can get more rounds in once they're ready for that. There's other benefits that I know I missed, but change it up and challenge. Um, I encourage you to never do the same practice two days in a row if it's with the same bunch of kids. How many of you do that? Like I did it. For years I did it. Um, and some of us are limited with equipment. We're limited with what we can do. Some of us don't have 3D. Some of us have 3D. Um, so we do station work sometimes, where we'll set up just turkey, coyote, bear. They have to rotate through those three. Then we have another station, 15 meter, 10 meter blank bell. Then we'll have another station, string bow, they journal, or they blank bell. Journal, I'm talking like mental game. That's what that's for. We incorporate that quite a bit in our high school. So I encourage you to come up with stations. Our kids really like that. They do well with stations. Um, and this could even be the AccuBow that they came out with. Elastic, whatever you can come up with. Now, createyourbrackets.com. How many of you have ever used this in your life? Any PE teachers out there? Okay, PE teachers, you gotta use this. Okay, createyourbrackets.com. I absolutely love this, and the kids love it. The only thing is, I'm one, I'm really sometimes terrible at finishing what I start. And as a coach, it's not good. Okay, because they want the result, they want the end result. So I encourage you, if you do this, keep it small groups, small names. That way you can get through it. We tried to do a whole team round robin. That was a joke to 38 kids. You can't do that. Um, so upperclassmen shootout. Here's what it looks like. You go into printbrackets.com and you enter your names. You've got Alex Shoemaker, Jackson Sargent, Olivia Holder, Jeremiah Jones, Jocelyn, Clay Sneed. And you can enter even an animal that you want them to be on or the targets because there's a location. So you can enter whatever. So then all you have to do at practice is say, okay, round one, we have on the ramp. Does that say ram? 15 meter. No. 15 meter. Alex and Jackson. Ram. Olivia and Jeremiah. Antelope. Jocelyn and Clay. And they go and they shoot. So now you're getting them to score. But to me, you're, you're not creating as much target panic because it's now in a different way, if that makes sense. So you're still getting competition. And I love doing this like a week of a tournament. So they're getting competition in. They're getting ready for a tournament. But it's not like that whole, okay, well, I'm setting it. You know, they do that math in their head. Well, I just shot this and this and this, and I know that it's going to be, and then they start playing the, the game in their head, the middle game. So, I personally love this. We go through rounds, and we have a winner. 
So we'll have, if you, and, that, and this is great too because then you can have your advanced brackets and make it, they have so many different options you can do on this. I just like to customize it for the kids, but I encourage you to, I encourage you to try it if you can, even elementary, even middle school. It's a great competitive thing that we do and I, I really enjoy this one. And then obviously right here, it defaults. So like Alex, it's gonna default her because she's the first person to be the first target. So like you would have to pre-go through this and just swap her up on a couple over here. Does that make sense? That's the only negative thing about that. But peer coaching. So if you are in a situation where you can't split time, I encourage you to peer coach. Well, how many of you peer coach ready? How many of you guys do that? Okay. I can't say this enough. I, when I started the program at Pearl Junction, I'm not an archery person. <laughs> it's crazy, right? I was a rifle person hunting growing up, not with a bow. I still have not shot a deer with a bow to this day. I have a, I have a big girl bow. I practice. I just have not hit that part yet. Okay, I haven't even taken a shot yet. But so I say this because to me, coaching for years. And not being that person, an actual competitive person with a bow, I can pick up a bow and shoot tighter groups than a lot of my kids. And I'm not talking like elementary, I'm talking like high school competitive kids. Because when you tell your something over, you tell yourself something over and over and over, what happens? You do it without even thinking about it. So when kids peer coach, they're now looking at it, they're now saying it, and it makes them better without them even realizing it. So, Example would be if a partner is standing, mirroring, and we keep it safe, if this is the line, and I'm shooting this direction, and this person's here, and I just make sure their toes are actually all on this side and not downrange, and they just mirror. So they could just be watching the stance and watching the set draw hand, and then I literally have them walk behind and make sure that string is where it's supposed to be, and they check. And then they check the boat hand, make sure that's in the right position. And then they get off the line, and then they do it again. And then they get off the line, and they do it again. And then after so many times, they switch places. And then they will go, we'll advance it all the way through a full shot, but they're just looking for little things. And we generally do a lot of this um, the very beginning of the year, obviously, when we're really breaking down form. And then we'll do it again throughout the season as we need to. But I cannot say enough good things about peer coaching. I just, I, it's really helped, I believe, our program because, again, you're saying it, they're seeing it, and it's not coming from me, okay? Because sometimes they'll go over and they're like, hey, we just had a breakthrough. And I'm like, really? Because I just told you the same thing, you know? So it's one of those things, when their peers are helping them, it's kind of, it can kind of be more beneficial. Competing with honesty and integrity as archers, we strive to shoot our best while competing with integrity, honesty, honesty is an expectation, sportsmanship and composure and obligation. We encourage others and understand our responsibility to self-officiate and protect the field with an overall goal of bringing the archery way into everyday life. Um, I really, I love this program. They are my second family. I tell them that all the time. I love what I do. I enjoy the kids. But we can't lose sight of what the program stands for. This is copy word from word from NAS website. Um, it's easy to get overwhelmed with the, the competition of it, wanting to win and us feeling defeated when our team or an individual doesn't do how good they should do. But at the end of the day, this is the most important thing. Um, and I asked myself this, how did I make my team feel today? Did I make them feel like failures? Did I make them feel excited to be here tomorrow? Did I encourage them to compete with great character, character they can take with them beyond the range? Did I model good character traits for them? Should they be excited to come back and practice? Now, modeling, here's the thing. All of us have had to make major adjustments because of COVID. And there's been a lot of frustration. Um, last year, when we thought the only thing left was the outdoor IBO tournament in Pennsylvania, we had a whole group of kids that were gonna go for the first time, we were gonna take a team, it was so exciting, and last minute it was canceled. Now I had two choices. I could act extremely frustrated and be negative about it, or be positive. So I feel like sometimes, your kid's behavior is a reflection of you, whether you like it or not, just like your own kids at home. Okay, we're not getting into that. But, because um, I, need, I need somebody like, to counsel me through that. Um, but I just believe when you, when you make your kids find the positive every day, doesn't matter, like state, 
we are very competitive in the state of Missouri. We're a competitive team. Um, I don't. I, I tell the kids all the time, you will stay humble, otherwise it's not worth winning. To me, it's not worth winning if we are not a humble program. So they know the bit. They know what they're capable of, but at the end of the day, they also know this isn't an advanced sport. You shoot one time, you leave the range, that's it. It's not a basketball tournament where you keep advancing. You go out, give it your all, walk away with your head held high, and it is what it is. As a coach, you can't be mad at them for that. They walked away with a great score and somebody beat you because they were better that day. It is what it is. So I just, we really preach positivity. We do not allow negativity on the range. That goes back to the expectation. If there's negativity, it's really funny because now they throw each other under the bus. Hey, they were negative, they've got push-ups. I'm like, yes, they do, go do them. We just, we don't allow negativity in our range. Um, keep practices closed. This might be an odd one, but how many of you have coached other sports? How many of you are an athlete yourself? Okay, so I know from every, all the sports that I've coached, when you allow parents to come in, then they think they have a voice. And I'm a parent, okay? So I just, we have had, and we were not at the school though also, we've been at other facilities. So when you're at a grocery store and you have parents walking in and then they want to say, high school, this has never been an issue because I've been in charge of high school, but in our middle school program for a while, we had parents coming in that would say, and then now like if, if I'm coaching her, her dad's sitting here coaching her also. So now it's it's not productive. Because now he's counteracting what I'm telling them to do and it's not healthy. So we, and I say that, and I have, um, there's times when the week of our tournament is the very first, the last weekend of January, we run one of the first tournaments in our area in January. That is a week, that is a week I'm completely honest with the kids, listen, I have to have my phone on me because there's going to be coaches calling me for questions about the tournament. And our um, MDC rep, Amy Rhodes, he's probably going to be calling me when we have, or we co-host a tournament at a university in the town uh, with other local schools. And it's a really big tournament. Academy used to sponsor it. Um, and we have schools all over the area come to it. It's a really fun tournament. But it's also when you're working with the college, when you're working, you just, just be honest with your kids. If you're having if you have stuff going on, let them know. That way, if they see you on your phone, they don't look at it as disrespectful. They know it's for or, you know, a purpose and a good reason. Um, so I just feel like be open and honest with them. It goes a long way. Um, there's days where I'll come in and if work, working with high school upperclassmen in an outdoor pursuit setting and somebody started a fire they weren't supposed to start, and I'm frustrated because it's a liability. I'm just honest with them. Like, listen, guys, I've had a bad day, but you are my positive right now. You're what I want to come to. I'm happy to be here. You're going to get me out of this funk that I'm in right now. And they, res they respond very well. We create a family atmosphere is what we do at practice with high expectation, just man. So this past year was actually the first year that we got away with closing practices, thanks to COVID. And we want to keep that. Yeah. And our biggest concern is how do you deal with well, what you want to see? What do you what do you keep from us at your practices that you don't want us to see? Then you tell okay, I gotta be let me think about what I said first. Okay. Uh, the, the like bold part of me with the backbone was to say, ask them what the basketball coach would say. Mm -hmm. Ask what the volleyball coach would say, you know. And we have a lot of single sport athletes, this is their head. They have no other experience. Right, and so I would just I would tell where do you practice at? Uh, you do practice in the gymnasium. I would just I would talk to your administration, see if they'll back you. That's the number one thing if they'll back you. I have a great relationship with our athletic director, so I get backed pretty easily, which is great. Um, but I I would just say we want their we want their focus when they're here. This is our time. We want their focus. Now, we used to practice in a grocery store the last one day. You guys can set your car lot. You know what I mean? So, but now we're in a more closed facility and they can't see unless they look in a window, a little window. So I would just say it's our time. And on the range, you guys will have, you know this, you'll have those parents, binoculars. We don't allow that. Like, this is our time. When I coached basketball, I remember a girl, we butted heads because she's shooting a free throw. I'm looking at dad in the stands. And I, again, this is just, this is just the expectations I was put in place before I ever coached basketball through volleyball. That is a no. My job is to prepare you for a high school team, competitive team, and this isn't this isn't healthy. So it just I would talk to administration, see if they'll get on the same page with you, because you want the focus there. 
we again we have just had and it's a grocery store so what happened is dollar we have a dollar general beside us it's a little town but random people would just come in i'm not kidding hey what's going on in here we love archer i'm like who are you this is like stranger danger you know i'm serious like you have no idea who these people are like so we just had we started locking the door just started locking the door and it's not to be rude it's for their safety you know and i would just say it's our time with them and hopefully they'll respect that you want their full focus yeah. because we put in a lot of time and most of us don't get paid i would guarantee you that so um that is all that i have is there any questions whatsoever can you talk a little bit about what you do with the journal with what with the journal the journal okay um actually yes the journaling I talked way too fast, I told you I would. Um, real quick, before you leave, if there's questions for the panel discussion, make sure you fill these out. Does anybody want one? I can dish these out, pass them on. Okay. Um, but maybe that's for the panel discussion if you have a question. The journaling, okay. So, uh, the first year I got started, I had no idea what I was doing, I'm going to be honest. Not one clue what I was doing. And luckily I had a very good friend of mine who competitively shot archery, Jesse Ellis. So she came in and helped me figure out what the heck I was doing. And um, Lainey Basham with Winnie in Mind. That is what our program implemented. They journal, they come up with a process. That's what, that's what our program is taken in. Now, it's in doses, because that's a real thick book. I mean, like, deep, okay? So with winning in mind, Lady Basham, that is the mental, you know, we started there and we've just kind of taken what would work for our kids. Um, but she asked me about the journaling, what do we journal? Um, if they're having a good day, I want them to write down what went well. You know, and they've had to, they, and it could even just be, there's times where we've said, in your journal, I want you to get it out and you're going to, out of 50 shots, how many of them were great shots, good shots, and you need to work shots. They just kind of grade their shots. So it's not about score. I'm really anti-score, to be honest. Um, so we try to have them focus on everything else, what went positive. They always have to leave on positive. Like there's even been days where I'll just go to them, tell me positive, tell me positive, tell me positive. Because my own son is the hardest, I, I won't coach him, and he's gonna be on the, our middle school team, and I cannot coach my own child. How many of you can relate, anybody? Okay, yes. <laughs> so it's like, I can't because he's, he already knows everything, but he gets frustrated because he's not perfect, but this should be easy. You just lift a bow up and quit. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm coaching you. So I already told my assistant, like, he's all yours because he's just wired differently. So, um, he needs a mental game. <laughs> he's, he's just, he has a hard time finding the positive. He's that kid. So, um, any other questions, please? We got a lot of time. Yes, sir. I have one. So you're, you know, it's competitive sport, and you're going competitive, and you're wanting these, uh, the, the archers to improve and be competitive. Um, but yet, you also, with NASP, it's the, the idea of getting and reaching out to kids that aren't necessarily maybe included in the more traditional football, basketball, volleyball, right. baseball sort of sports that have that stigma of super competitiveness with them. Have you ever ran into a situation where you had a parent that um, didn't necessarily like jive with the, you, like, the way that you teach the competitiveness? So case in point, uh, we had a parent that didn't like the fact that we would occasionally, and we didn't implement the push-ups with our students. Some of our students actually started to make themselves do push-ups. It was like right. pure, pure push-ups. Right. But we had parents, we had pushback from parents saying that we were too competitive, that we were pushing. And so I was just wondering if you had any advice on how to manage um, parents that maybe didn't come from that competitive aspect. I mean, I grew up playing right. competitive sports, and so I, I kind of laughed whenever I had this parent tell me that I was too competitive. because so I was like, you've never seen me as a basketball coach. Right. And it was like, this is way relaxed. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, how do you navigate that with parents that probably have never played competitive sports? And like, so like, how? No, there actually was a situation um, years ago. I believe it's when, how many of you are in Missouri? Okay, so when we had Bullseye at Branson, and then we had to go to Jeff City for three, that year, um, we were at the state, and, we, and it was one of those years I knew we had a shot at the whole, you know, I knew we were there. And we had a, we had an individual on our team that she was very um, boy crazy, 
there and her boyfriend's on the team. And she was not an athlete. Um, she was just, anyway, so long story short, they performed and they bombed. We bombed that year. And there was three of them that individually qualified for nationals. But in afterwards though, I did not say this, but my assistant said this. And remember, this is the competitive side. Because we were, we, we were both in sports and we, you know, and she's like, how can you suck so bad? <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, you can't say that. So, but and here's what happened. Her dad came back to the athletic director and it was this big ordeal. And he said, now listen, I'm a football coach. I understand in that moment, but no other parent would have ever said anything because all of those kids understood. And, and we don't talk to our kids that way. Please understand that. We don't. Um, that was just a moment that she said that and she's like, okay, you guys, this is what you did well, but you know at some point, and here's the day, all of us have off days, good days, whatever, but there's also days where your team just needs to get it together, you know what I mean? And that was that day. We just need to get it together, like, focus, you know, whatever. So, anyways, ended up, it, he, he came down off the rocker, we had a conversation, but it was just one of those, she was never in a competitive competitive format. And she had parents that babied and just fed her anything she needed. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's just that it's just that mentality. But with us, we don't generally run into parent problems because I don't cut anybody. We don't cut anybody and I say you're guaranteed this many tournaments, but there's gonna be varsity only tournaments. And it's middle school as well because we have enough for two teams. So it's like in middle school and high school both. So at middle school level Listen, your kids are guaranteed this this many tournaments. Just because we can put 24 on the roster doesn't mean we're taking 24 to state. But see, and this was hard for me because our um, the two the couple that did our middle school program before me, they took two teams to state just to take two teams to state, which is fine. But then the next year it was like, why aren't we taking two teams to state? You know, and so that was kind of difficult because that was this year. But I mean, I just make it very clear from the get-go, the scores talk, but at the same point, I will take a 240 over a 280 any day if your attitude is terrible. You know, I am not that competitive to where I just want the score. Yeah. Now, if they qualify individually, I can't steal that from them. You know, you just have to talk them up and try to make them a good sport. But, like, it just, I don't know. We just set very clear expectations from the get-go, and we don't have... We just don't have issues. Do you have like a parent meeting then at the beginning yes, of the year? Yes, we always have a parent meeting, yes. And that is another thing, like generally what we do is we have one as soon as school starts, like end of August, early September, and we say, hey, this is when sign-ups are, these are the expectations. How many of you have dues your kids have to pay? Exactly. Okay, so that way they're prepared for that. And then once we have that, we have a kickoff meeting. To, am I moving around too much? Sorry. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, then once we actually have our meeting and we know our expectations, we've talked to the upperclassmen, what are they? We tell the parents everything. We're, we're very, this is what's happening, this is the expectation, they cannot be late. If they are late, even if it's your fault, they still have, they still have their discipline of being late. Now, if there's a car broke down, yes, we're crying out loud. We're not, you know what I mean? If there's a funeral, if you're sick, then by all means, there's nothing for that. You know, you just, you let them take care of family. You know, but we just tell them the score speaks for itself, but if it comes down to where we're making a roster for state, I had it happen this year. There was a freshman that came to me and I said, buddy, listen, your maturity level is not there. You're gonna be a distraction for the entire team. You're not going. You know, we've had parents later come back and say, that was the best thing you ever did is tell me to go. So not every parent, but you know what I'm saying. Like enough to where you're like, okay, yeah, but yes, um, we all of our tree um, practices are very regular PE courses. We don't have any outside we practices. So. <laughs> yeah, well, but the, the problem you're talking about is really a big, a bigger, bigger issue when you're having a full gamut of kids in a class that aren't there necessarily for the competition. So I don't really focus on it. I'm trying to um, find other reasons why the kids would come out of tree. And we, we, we go to that on a right. daily basis. But one of the ways that I, you know, you know I do want to require them to compete at least a couple tournaments in a year and put it in the course syllabus and parents have to sign off on that syllabus so they know that that's part of it. Because I have run into parents say, my kids not going to compete in this competition. 
I don't want to be um, But that's, that's how I've covered it recently. Okay. Yes, ma'am. We have a contract the kids have to sign, the and yes. parents. And that helps sometimes mm -hmm. at the end when they say, oh, I didn't know about this tournament. Oh, I didn't know this. Well, here, you signed this. And that, that has helped us. And I'm glad you said that. We have a contract, not about tournament behavior expectations it's, it's, and then practices yes, in there. And we yes. do have a contract that they do sign yes. and it goes over what you know what the expectations are. And that, that is a great idea. I need to add that for the next one because we do do that. So rubrics are so it's so kind of like a rubric, so it's like different levels. So for beginner, uh, intermediate, advanced archers, like what's the expectation for? Yeah. It's just the biggest problem that we ran into. Is parents <coughs> not like parents that haven't done that. It's just like parents coming in thinking that you know this is just going to be like a quiet class and you're not actually going to coach right. them to, to improve. And sometimes as a coach, you have to tell the kids not problem. You have to you know kind of figure out ways to motivate them. So. That's a good idea too. Yes. Uh, yes, we go, high school goes three times a week, middle school two times a week. Yeah. How many tournaments do you hear in Uh, okay. I'm going to say school names just so I can count them, but I don't sure. Um, we can't hear the question. Okay, so how many, sorry, questions. how many tournaments do we guarantee? It's so many over. We generally guarantee four. Now, the sad thing about that is they're paying for the videos. So that's why we guarantee it. But uh, I mean, our high school, they have to, everybody has to pay for their own tournaments. Um, so we guarantee, but it's not 3D. We don't guarantee 3D. 3D is just generally one team. Um, so we guarantee four. Ours, yeah, four to five. The local, like the local basic tournaments. And then there's like a, Big regional tournament at the end of the season. Most of them get to go to that, and then state is just, yeah. Now our elementary team takes the whole team to state. Yeah. Yes. Do you have a sample practice plan or breakdown of what you do on that time period? I can tell you. Um, okay, so when when we start practice. They generally have jobs they do as soon as they get there because, again, we're not at our facility. So they're pulling targets out, they're setting the range, and then as soon as they're done with that, they're supposed to be on a string bow. On the line, on a string bow. If they're goofing around and hitting each other with them, obviously we step in and correct that. Um, and then we generally go into, if it's the beginning of the year, they'll do where you blow the whistle, they go get in their stance, they may go all the way up to pre-draw, that's it. They come back down and do that multiple times. Um, if it's in season, then we'll start generally at blank bell, and then we move back. I mean, typical practice, I mean, I'm just trying to think of our typical practice schedule. We do a lot of station stuff, especially, especially when you're getting where you really know where kids are. We'll have three or four blank bell targets set up. We'll have 10 meter, we'll have 15 meter, and then we'll put kids where, where, and where, and then that way we can really focus on certain kids. Now, if we have kids really struggling with target panic, I may not let them see a target for a week, two weeks. If it's that bad, they'll just blank bell until they'll just blank bell. Um, and I will say, how many of you have never done 3D? It's not in your school yet. Okay, a couple, okay. I think 3D, I mean, I love 3D, because I think it just gives them a break from looking at a bullseye target. I think it's good stuff. But. When shall, when shall season start? Okay, so, I was crazy. <laughs> we would gradually start before Halloween, like once a week, pull in the newbies, and then November we would come in twice a week, optional, man kind of mandatory if you're not another sport. And then December, same thing. And then we can't technically start. This is the thing about if you're in a bigger school district and you want the respect of other sports, they made us have a defined season. Um, so our defined season is January 1 to the end of March. So we have no support from the school outside of those times. So we start like, I mean, like I start school next week and I'll have tryouts the week after that. And then our first tournament is in September and it goes all the way to March. So, like, but do you do, you do nationals? Do you go on? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do. it's literally around. 
So like, I mean, it's, it's great. You're like, it's January. This we start, we start September. I mean, our first, our first one in September. And I will say, for our kids, I know they. I was seeing that they were burnt out, and I was burnt out. If I'm burnt out, they're burnt out. So we we decided that we're not even going to do. We stopped October. No, we don't do any tournaments November, December. We don't do that. Now, one thing we are going to start implementing this year is outdoor idea. Because luckily the facility we're at is a, an event center, so there's actually like an outdoor arena that we're going to set up targets and stuff and do that. But um, we have given them more time off than ever the last two years. So for example, Christmas break, we may have one optional, two optional practices. Be with your family, enjoy your family. Um, if we have a really, really great weekend, sometimes we're not, we may take off practice on that, you know, the next Monday. Um, but we have given our kids a lot more time off because I think as coaches, we think more means better. That's not true. I mean, it really, I have just realized that with our program, when I've given them time off, we've taken gains forward. Mm -hmm. And so our off season, I try to think very relaxed. They, they kind of hate it because it's all, I mean, it's, I make them go through the middle. Like it's basically boot camp as far as your form. And I just tell them, I'd rather get this over now than January when you come in for the actual season. So we try to knock all the basic stuff out, November, December, get with those newbies and hammer it out. But yeah, I have learned to give them a lot of time off. We and also, even in season. We also ended up shortening our season because we we were preparing for nationals and we had some middle schoolers that were just done. Like, we're going to shoot it because we said we we're going to shoot it, but I want to be done yesterday. It was too long. We started not yeah, and I mean, and that's another thing. In the beginning of season, like, we're, and I'll tell you, this is what we're doing next. Like, when we have our meeting and they've signed up, there's going to be a very serious heart-to-heart -heart this year about the season. And it is this. Our goal is to take a full team to state and a full team to nationals. After that, I personally am out. Because when you do, when you do um, Burl Beach, which is a great trip, but that's the beginning of June, and then you go have kids going to Seven Springs in August. I'm not going to that one. But what I found is that not only is it negatively impacting my own family, but then you have kids who are not all in. Like there's only, like Myrtle Beach when we went out there, and I don't make excuses, I always tell the kids, there is zero excuse for how you perform. You are only, you are the responsibility for you, your mental state, everything. Like there is zero excuses. Um, because I mean, and I talk to a lot of coaches, and, I, and the number one thing I hate hearing is, well this person wasn't here, this person wasn't here, this, this, and so I'm like, we went out to Myrtle Beach and had a kid shoot that had never shot on our team, but she shot in my outdoor pursuits class because we had a girl drop. So did she shoot a 280 plus? No, she shot like a 240, who cares? She had class, you know? So it was just one of those things like we made it fun, we made it work, but when you have a ton of seniors that are like, yeah, let's go, let's go, and then they drop. They dropped. So I mean, I had five seniors bail. So, you know, you work with what you have, you keep it positive, but I do believe in the time off. You have to. As a coach, you have to. I mean, you got to refresh yourself. I, I just ordered three books, different archery stuff to go through, just to get stuff different. Because after this is my 10th year with archery, I'm getting burnt out as far as the same practice routine. And I tell them, you're the only sport, for the most part, that's doing the exact same thing every time. Every other, every, everybody else is reacting. You know, volleyball, you're reacting. Basketball, you're reacting. You have plays. If this happens, you do this. You know? So I just, for them, I think it's good to have time off, but the creativity and practice. And, and any time, you guys, I think my email is on that. I'm happy to send you a full-out practice schedule of what we do, what a two-week schedule would look like. Happy to do that. Happy to do that. And I may go, home, I may go back to the room tonight, type one up, and try to print it and give it to you somehow. Um, because it is. It's a long season. And you want to keep them fresh. Now, NRA grade, how many of you have received that? Well, how many of you even know about it? Raise your hand. Okay, you have to take advantage of that in your state if it's there. Okay, I say that because we just got six, yes. Yes, the NRA grant. Oh. Okay, I say this because if you want some fresh stuff, like we just got bag targets that have nothing to do with NAPS. But we got bag targets and stands from the NRA grant that we are setting up an outdoor range just so our kids can get out of the range. To give them something else to shoot at, because they're still working on boards, they're still getting better, they're still shooting groups, right? 
So change it up as much as possible. Put, have them draw a picture of something to shoot at and stick it on them. You know, I'm serious. I do not let our kids, and it was finding a balance. It was finding a balance of, uh, now not somebody to take a picture of. Um, okay, I'll tell on myself on this one. We had, we had a day where I told everybody, okay, we can put whatever you want up on the target as long as it's appropriate, you know, this and that. Walking by, checking targets, I'm like, oh my gosh, pull that off. Somebody had put a picture of their ex-boyfriend up there. I'm like, you cannot, absolutely cannot do that. Right? So I'm like, you can't do that. So anyways, yeah, you learn, but, um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I thought I heard you say you previously coached air rifle. I, I only teach it in my outdoor pursuits class. This is our third year. Okay, and uh, I guess the, the question is, uh, conflicting sports, kids doing more than you got a kid that comes to you and is in the band, I want to shoot arrows. Uh, how do you handle that? Do you handle that? Okay, I'm glad you said that. There's actually me and another coach were just talking about this. Coming to practice and going to tournaments. How many of you are totally guilty of flighting because they have something else going on. So now you're on the range hours longer because you're flighting these kids. I don't do it. I'm telling you right now, I don't do it. Because if they're part of a team, they need to shoot with the team. So I encourage you, if I encourage you to eliminate that, that is so much stress on yourself. And I tell my parents this too. I said, you guys need to understand something. At 8 a.m. when this flight opens, it's insane. <laughs> like, my gray hair just grew out. It is insane. I'm like, so you need to understand that in seconds, flights are filling. So I do not have time to click on, oh, down here at 2 p.m. for you. Here's the 1 o'clock. I'm sorry. It is what it is. Like, if your kids want to be a part of this program, they will shoot when the team shoots. So back to practice, they will practice when the team practices. Now, with that said, if there is a band concert and something they can't go to, our graciously our elementary team, because they practice at a different time, we generally are able to work with our other teams to make sure they get practice. And as long as it's not where they're always at that practice and they're mainly with their main team, we allow that to happen. And I know there's schools that, um, and, and I have, I'm kind of back and forth on this. There's some schools that there's not really an expectation of being at practice. So you may have a kid that shows up to one practice and it's a phenomenal shot. They let him shoot at state. I think it's wrong, but that's, but at the same point, I am coming at it from the competitive side. We're trying to have the respect of other sports, so I'm trying to look at it as other sports ex expectations. Now, if you have, if you're with a, for example, if you were a center shot group, okay, and you have kids that are from churches, that kind of stuff, and you can only meet here and there, that's kind of a different story. If you're working with a homeschool group, if you're, everybody's got their own situations, but to me, if you're running a competitive sport with alongside your other sports at your school, I think we should try to have the same expectations in a sense. But at the end of the day, we're trying to get these kids to do something for a lifetime. So there's that balance. And that's why at my outdoor pursuits class, I let anybody in that class shoot in our tournament. And they love it. Yeah, because they're not on a the team. They just jump in and shoot and they make their own team. So it gives them that opportunity. Yes. Can you share those you said you purchased? Yes, with Winning in Mind by Lanny Basham. And then the Energy Bus. Oh, the ones I just purchased. Let me get on my Amazon account. <laughs> Hold on, I can tell you. One was just archery drills. Archery drills. Yeah, archery drills. I mean, you'd think I know enough archery people I could just ask around, but I figured a book you can highlight and mark on. Um, I can specifically get it for you. Who else have a question? You mentioned it a little bit, but um, our team, the majority of the coaches have archers on the team. And so we have, by default, parents at practice, and some of them only coach their kids, um, which isn't usually beneficial for that. So how is, like, the head coach, that's not me, but how is the head coach, would you have them navigate Having those coaches, like I, my daughter shoots, I don't coach her. How do you deal with a coach that only wants to coach their own kid? Yes. Okay, well, I have, um, <laughs> he's here, my <laughs> assistant, his daughter is on the team, yeah. and 
I tell him the lawyer. And that's what I do with my daughter. Like, you make it, and here's why. Oh, how, like, right. what do you do with those? No, but it's right, like, I'm telling that. him, I need you, like, because you're going to want to see how she's doing. I need you to not. I'm going to coach her here. You coach her outside. Right? And if they don't. If they don't. <laughs> If they don't, be like, listen, we have this many kids. Like, we have this many kids. I really need you to help other kids. Otherwise, you're not benefiting. Her. I mean, you're really not. You can coach her outside of. I mean, I'd be nicely warm, so. Actually, there's some together. Yeah, maybe. You have a student contract. You can have a coach's contract. Yes, coach's contract. And we do. We. I meet with my coaches. Um, I meet with my coaches every year. I lay down the wall basically, and we get all on the same page because it is important. If you're, um, if you're, how many of you have, how many of you have various coaches like for elementary, middle school, high school? How many of you are the head dog in charge? Yeah. So we need to be really transparent about what we want because I know in volleyball when I coached it, the head coach and I was the assistant freshman coach, but she made it very clear. Like, listen, at this age, we just want them to know this and have fun. You know, free ball transition, when the ball comes over the net, are they getting off the net? You know, and are they getting their serve over? That was literally the only focus. So our elementary program is to instill good fundamentals, safe, are they covering the points of the air, do they know the scoring protocol, are they having fun? So that's, that is the goal of the elementary level. The middle school is to prepare them for the high school team, start working on the middle game, and the elementary does too, composure, they work on that, but we really start just kind of easing it in. And we just, I'm just very across. And I'm blessed. I've got good people to work with, easy people to work with. And all their kids have been on the team at one point. Yeah. So now the Lego boys are coming, and that's scary. <laughs> We're going to get to coach mine, which is great. Yes, ma'am. How do you select your team for states? Okay. Uh, I look at it this way because you got kids that'll shoot a great and then never get it, right? So, I select it based on consistency. I look at the last three tournaments, their overall average. If they had the beginning of season, if they did great, great, and then they tanked and never came out of it, you know. But I've also taken kids um, that weren't on their high that normally wouldn't make it because they were the best leader I've ever had. And um, actually, I've got one. He kind of went to slump, severe target panic. Um, and that's hard to coach. That was a new thing for our program about two years ago. I really had to research, do some stuff because that wasn't something I was really familiar with. Um, but he came out of it at the end of this year, and he's one I took last year to stay. And you just talk about a class act. And I told him, I said, buddy, listen, I know you're not where you want to be, but they need you here. Your presence is more than your score right now. And he came out of it, and it was a good thing. So I generally just look at the last little bit. Now, I won't just fill a roster to fill a roster either, though. I won't. And there's some, there's seniors. I let them kind of have a little rank if they're right on the edge. But I also look at this kid's a good leader. He's a freshman, and he's this is probably going to be the boost he needs. So I look at a lot of different things on that. Your parents ever had a show with not a set, like form? No, I'm pretty. I mean, I'm pretty honest with them. I'm just like he's really immature. He's a virus. Like I'm sorry, your kid is negatively impacting the entire team. Like. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, I'm sorry, like, I just say it how it is, but in a nice way, remember that one, one yeah. nice yeah. but, um, and I had a girl a while back, she, uh, this has been years ago, and she was on varsity the whole season, but her negativity and her comments were so terrible, it got to the point of, like, listen, I think we both know you need to go. I like you, I think you like me but you are toxic. And she really, and she understood what I was saying though, because I explained it to her. I didn't just say this is what it is, I explained it to her. And that's a huge thing, like, and I tell the kids this, number one thing I say in a parent meeting, if your kid does not talk to me before you talk to me, there's a problem. And I will never talk to a kid, if it, or a parent, without their kid present, ever. My athletic director told me that, do not talk to that parent without, because here's what happens. Hey, did I say this to you? Yeah, you did say that to me. Did I say it in a nice way? Yeah, you told me this. You told me this is exactly what it was going to be. So what did you tell your parents? Like, what are we doing right now? Like, I'm very honest with, with our team, you know? So I just try to be very clear to parents. I mean, our, our 
opening meeting, I am energetic, I'm fired up, let's go, I can't wait for your kids, can't wait to coach your kids, I love your kids already, I got to pour it all out there. But I also tell them, but here's how it is, we have a great name for our program, we plan on keeping it, the expectation is high because eyes are watching us. Be the team everybody wants to be around, not the team nobody can stand to be around. Tell my kids that every day before every tournament, be the team everybody wants to be around. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. What else do you just do besides push-ups? <laughs> <laughs> um, we do dips with a chair. Oh, yeah. Dips. Um, what else do you do? It's been minutes. Do what? Crunches, yeah. Crunches, Russian twists. They hate burpees. Oh, yeah. burpees. Um, okay, <laughs> terrible thing about burpees. When you're on a concrete floor and a kid does a burpee, he's not athletic. Okay, so we had to ask the burpees. Um, but they are. They They're hate them. They hate them, they hate them yeah. Um, we make it very, we make it very basic. Nothing like overly challenging, but if they have to do 30 dips and then shoot, and we have a work, actually we have, this is the thing I need to write down. We have a 15 meter workout day. Love this day, they hate it, but I love it. Um, because they have to do, as soon as they hear their whistles to get their bow, they have to do 15 to 20 push-ups, no, no, 10. They have to do 10 push-ups, get their bow, go to the line, they hear the one, if they immediately pick that bow up, we start over. They have to let their heart rate come down before they shoot. So then next round, they have to do 25 jumping jacks. They hear the whistle, 25 jumping jacks, they go right at the 15 meter, and we're scoring. So we score the full six so they know where they're at. And I'm telling you, it's actually pretty exciting because we'll have kids that score, out, score outstanding when we do this. And there's kids that tank because they have no cardio, so they're dying, and it's fine. But I mean, we, we have a 15 meter workout day, and it's great. We'll have one round in there where they don't do anything, they just get to go up and shoot. But we make them get that heart rate down. But yes, sorry. Something non physical I implemented a few years ago was a demerit system. Just demerits, and then there were consequences for the demerits. Wait, what is it? Demerits. A demerit system for this point system. Instead of a physical. Oh, point system? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Not demerit. Okay. Flash it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that, that's important business. I'm with the Army, and, uh, or JRTC. Right. The Army, believe it or not, will not let us make kids do push ups. We can't discipline with physical stuff. Yep. Yep. So I'd say to you, suppose your school district walked in and said, you can't do that anymore. That's hazing and you're embarrassing my kid in right. front of everybody else. Right. So we need alternatives for, in some places. Right. And no, absolutely. Like and I will say, like, in our practice, by all means, this is not an over the top football practice. You know what I'm saying? It is not, we're not yelling, it is not that. What, it, what we have created is accountability in the sense that, for example, when we came off the line, there was one freshman, he was a stud. Stud freshman, this year, very hot, and he needed help. I'll just say that. Um, but he kept not covering the points of his arrows. And so it got to the point, we're like, all right, and we wouldn't say who it was, we never say who it was. Okay, everybody has 10 push-ups. And they're like, who's doing it? I'm like, I can't tell you that. And so then, senior found out who it was, they got it figured out, never had a problem with it again. Because it took an upperclassman stepping in, and I really push it on my upperclassmen. Like, you guys are seniors. There's 30 to 40 of you in here at a time. It is your job for accountability. And I put a lot of it back on them. Because it is not, and we have other, um, we'll do bow holds, we'll do string bow shots. Okay, you need to go do 15 string bow shots. Because we have kids that physically can't do, do certain things. Um, and we never do enough to where it's unrealistic. It's just enough to where, I don't want to be sore, you know? Like, we, we draw the line. It's nothing crazy. It's just enough to where they don't want to do it. Call me stupid, but what do you cover your arrows with? Your, your, oh, your just hands. your hands. Oh, I thought you meant like you were putting something on them. I'm like, no, we cap it every time. No, <laughs> no I'm sorry. Yeah, you just got to cover them. Yeah, from really fancy at home. Yes? What do you do with kids that want to sit out around? Okay, I don't, in, when we do stations, because again, we have that, um, we have like that journal, because here, I like them to make goals, and I always tell them, your goal can't be a number, it can't be a number, okay, I, I don't like numbers, so I just, we avoid that entirely, 
So the goal may just be, I want to get through eight rounds, because they got two warm-up rounds. I want to get through eight rounds and stay calm, What? They have their own stuff, okay? So they'll write that down. So if they want to take a round off, and we're not doing anything real, real specific, and it's just repetitive rounds, I'm like, okay, you can go journal. You can go write your goal statement. That's what you can do. Or you can go get on a string book, but you're not just going to sit, because it's way an hour. And you know, it's funny, because middle school has so much energy, but they're the worst. I mean, they really are. Like, coach, I need to sit down. I'm like, you've been sitting all day long at school. <laughs> So I don't know. Well, here's the deal. Um, years ago, we implemented with Winning in Mind. We actually read the book as a team. <laughs> they got in groups. They read the chapters. We went over it. Um, it was very good. Like our mental game went way up. But then we realized this is way overwhelming for this age group. We need to like condense what we're doing. Um, so the journals are mainly optional, but it's really for accountability. There's days when I say, get a piece of paper. You need to write this out and tell me. And we have checklists, I love this, okay? So you're coming up to a tournament and you want them to be accountable, but you're kind of making sure, okay, who's actually going, whatever. Like you have a lot in your mind going on. So I print out a checklist and it is every 3D animal, right and left sides, and then it says 10 meter, 15 meter, goal statement, and they have to check all that off that week of practice. And then I, and then at the end of that week, They'll bring it to me, I'll read the goal statement, see that they got everything done. Now, when I say uh, 3D aiming spots is what they're after. So when they know all this is checked off, I have all my 3D spots on the right side, all of them facing left, and then my 15 meters solid, my 10 meters solid. They have to look me in the eye and say, I'm ready, and then we go. <laughs> so checklist is a great thing because then it holds them accountable without you having to stay on top of it, as long as you have the accountability act. We are right on time. Thank you guys. I'm a, I'm a nut. I'm sorry. Thank